Hey everyone, welcome to my next video. And in this one, I'm gonna introduce you C++ from the perspective of up and coming uh, C++ developer that wants to try C++ after using C for some time. And although it says for bad metal embedded, this is just my safety so that I can explain all the topics that are relevant for embedded systems and avoid those that are not really used or actually uh, make sense for embedded, like exceptions and dynamic memory allocation, at least not for the beginner series. And uh, that means that this video is for all programmers, so it's not just for embedded, but if you want to program applications on your computer in C++, then definitely this series will be good for you because I'm gonna give all the basic things that you need to know about C++ and its differences to C, so you can probably just pick C++ and replace it with uh, the C compiler with the C++ compiler. And uh, I'm gonna give you also the argument, some justifications and also examples what C++ does better than C. So without further ado, let's go to some prerequisites. And so, as I said before, this is not just for bare metal embedded use cases, but for other C++ because, because C++ is for everything. So nothing is specifically for embedded. The compiler they're gonna be using is from ARM toolchain and it's the version 10.3.1. And these are some of the options that are gonna be using. So a uh, summary is for the C++ version, the optimization and the core that I'm using and uh, the others are for warnings and errors. All of this can be also tested on the Compiler Explorer and you can click on this link and uh, copy the URL and the Compiler Explorer will open up. So on the left you have the code, on the right you have the disassembly and on the bottom you have the compiler output. And as you can see the right compiler version and the flags are already inside. So this is the power of this link. And if I just type in a typo, you can see that the error in the compiler output. So I highly recommend you use this along with this video so you can test all of these things that I'm gonna be showing you. Also the C++ Bible, as I've called it, is the cppreference.com that you can use for all of this that I'm gonna be talking in this video. So it has all the knowledge for the past and the future implementations of certain things and also what's up and coming in the new C++23. So I highly suggest you bookmark this website for your learning part of C++. Now a few words on why I think C++ can be beneficial to you. Well, the C++ generates better compile time checks for existing implementations. So if you just drop in some C code into C++ compiler, it might generate more warnings or even errors for certain parts of the code. It has improvements on some existing features. So some tools that you use in C have been improved for either readability or actually functionality. So either uh, added functionality or a little bit changed. We have uh, lots and lots of more tools from either the standard library or just the way that language performs. And speaking about those lots of tools, it's the keywords. So the C++ has more than three times the total keywords than C. Also, all the keywords in C are also in C++, but do know that this is the total in the history, so some of them have either changed meaning uh, or have been deprecated. And I have three examples over here. So let's see export keyword was used up until C++11 for certain part for templates, but then uh, up until C++20, so for nine years it was not used, but then again in C++20 it was reused for modules. The auto keyword as a storage specifier was used in C and it still exists in C, uh, but in C++11 it was repurposed, so it's no longer a storage specifier, but it's actually automatic type placeholder for automatic type deduction. And it has uh, accumulated quite a few additional functions, but from C++17 it's been quite upgraded. So this way auto is not the same as in C anymore, at least not from C++11 onward. The register keyword was used until C++17, the way it was used in C, but from C++ onward it was uh, deprecated and is now unused and reserved. <laughs> and you, as you also saw, I quite mentioned C++ versions quite heavily. As you saw here, the versions were in increments of three years, so from the year 2011 onwards, uh, each release came in about three years. So right, C++ version matters because each version brings new either uh, compile time features, the compiler features or library features. And it's really important that your compiler supports a certain feature if you want to use it. That's why I picked appropriate versions that supports 
really almost the entirety of C++20 and it can be also used and it's the same version that I've used in the previous video. So it's nothing new or special. So about the versioning, so although C++ exists quite for a long time from the 80s, in fact, uh, the standardization only began in 98. And from then on in C++11, where the biggest flood of changes in the functionality, in the repurposing of the certain keywords uh, came about. So C++11 is seen as the bare minimum C++ because everything before that was just C with some additional functionality. And then a lot of improvements for compile time came in C++ 14 and 17, along with also some standard library additions, which was massive also in C++ 20. So now let's start with a familiar topic uh, to demonstrate how C++ can do some topics better than C. And let's start with enum. Enum is used everywhere for either giving names to certain numbers or just used as an, a, a variable placeholder for state machines or some sort. So by default in C and in C++, enum uh, declares a variable that is of uh, size int, so an integer, and depending on your platform, it's either 32-bit or different. So this is the way that you specify it. By default, the enumeration start at zero and then go one, two, and so on. And you can also give it the equal sign, so you can assign a particular variable a certain number, and then the uh, actual enumeration will continue from then on. Also, you can just pick them random numbers, and since this is an int, you can also input negative numbers. So, what if you want to use this enum? So, on the left is how it looks like in C usually. So, you have to use the enum keyword everywhere that you use the enum uh, variable. So in this case, I have an enum as an argument to the function. I also have to use enum before the name of the enum. If you want to specify uh, or declare a variable of type my enum, then I also have to provide enum in the front. So did they get tedious? So in the C, you see the type def all the time. So I'm specifying a type def of enum my enum. So now my enum is a name for this enum. Therefore, I can just use my enum anywhere. And C++ changed it. So C++ natively drops the requirement for the enum keyword. So you only need to declare enum or define the enum as the classical way in C, but then you don't need to use the type def. You can just omit the enum keyword at all. So it looks much cleaner. Now let's get to some checks that are passed by C, but catched in C++, which is great. So let's say for the compatibility sake, this is the uh, declaration of our function foo that takes in an enum. And if we pass it the val2, which is one of its members, then it's fine. Uh, but if we just passed a number, well, the C compiler doesn't give any warnings at all. But in C++, we get an error because we just passed a number, but the function expected an enum. Although enum is an integer behind the scene, C++ distinguishes between an integer and an enum. These are two different types and shouldn't be converted. And actually, if you look here, I put in 55. But this enum that I gave in the previous explanation, by default went 0, 1, 2. So the 55 is not here at all. So this is a double error. So what happens in C++? Well, C++ prevents implicit conversion from int to enum. Therefore, you just can't convert a simple integer number into an enum and the compiler will not say anything. And this, in fact, is the error that the compiler gives you. So invalid conversion from int to my enum, because my enum is a special type. It's not an int, although it acts like an int in the background. So this is one useful error. So you cannot have implicit conversions without the compiler uh, knowing. Also, implicit conversion from enum to int. So as we said, the enum is used as a naming for a certain integer value. So we have an enum over here, and if we uh, call a bar function that accepts an integer, and we put in val2, this is completely fine in C and C++, because, well, this is the actual use of enum. So it's defined, because we know what value val2 stores. It's, in this case, 115. So this is fine, but what if for certain uses you don't want your enum to implicitly convert to integers, so you want to use it like a state machine state, so it's not a valid integer number, it's just a placeholder for a state. Well, for that, you can use a class, a new class. 
So in this case, you just add the class keyword behind the enum and suddenly your enums cannot convert to integer at all. Uh, the one thing that is added that you have used the scope. So you have to tell from where the val2 comes from because natively enum has all its members publicly as in the previous example, which can just refer to val2 and it knows that it comes from this enum over here. But when you use enum class, this creates a local scope from which you have to extract the enum. So this is where you use the double colon and the name of the enumeration. So you know exactly from where this enumeration comes from. And now this gives us an error because we try to convert my enum to int and compiler doesn't have a way of doing so. And the last thing with enum, this is an addition in C++. By default, the enum type is int. So behind the scenes, this is storing one int. And on 32-bit ARM, this is four bytes. But in C++, we can change the size, providing it's an integer type. So this is default. And here I set colon and int 8t. So I specified that this enum is now of 8-bit wide. And it's really useful if you don't want your enums to be larger than they need to. Or in the last case, this is particularly useful, we can say that, well, my enum is actually a char. So we can just define a few characters and you can print them as printable characters, which is quite handy. It's not just an integer number, it can be a character as well, as long as it's an integer type. So unsigned, signed, integer, all goes. The next topic is of variable initialization or assignment. So yeah, this seems weird. Like, yeah, we defined variables and that's fine. And we declared them all the same way, like the first example on line one. So this is how we uh, declare a variable A and also define its value initialization. But the C++ has another one behind the scenes and it's the curly bracket initialization, which prevents narrowing. So what the hell is that? So I have two examples over here. We have an int 8 equals minus 5, which is fine because int goes from minus 2 billion or something to plus 2 billion because it has a range of 32 bits or 31 in each direction of plus and minus. But what if we try to assign minus 5 to the unsigned, which goes from 0 to a positive number, so not a negative number? So what this would do is give it a very large number because it would overflow because minus 5 is in 2's complement quite a large number. So this goes well with the compiler. So compiler gives no warnings or errors, but it's an So what we can use in C++ is the curly bracket initialization. So we use the curly brackets with a value, and now the compiler gives you an error. In this case, the narrowing conversion of minus 512 from int to unsigned int. So this number here is an int, but we try to store it in an unsigned number, and this is causing narrowing. And exactly the same example here. If you try to put in this number into int, it won't fit because this is the size of an, a maximum size of the unsigned, which has the double the range of the int. And the compiler again doesn't give any warnings, even the C++ compiler, so this is an oof. But if you use the curly bracket initialization with int, it gives the similar errors before. So we try to stuff an unsigned int into an int and it's gonna uh, chop down the value, so this is not gonna be valid. And for the last one in this video are the references. So what is a reference? Well, a reference, as you maybe heard it a few times, is actually a pointer uh, disguised as it has already been uh, dereferenced. It is also constant and cannot be reassigned. So it's like a const pointer. Uh, so in other cases, you can, in other languages, it's also called a name, name alias because it actually aliases an existing variable. The condition is it has to be initialized. It's not like a pointer which can be just instantiated and then assign the value. Uh, and of course, you use it as a dereference pointer. And of course, I'll give you a few examples. So on the top, I have two variables of type int, a and b. And then I defined a const pointer to an int with the address of the variable a. So this is great. So we declare and assign the value of pointer p. And if you try to change the value to where the pointer is pointing, we dereference the pointer and assign the value 4, 44. So this value goes into variable A. So variable A over here is now 44. But if you try to reassign to where the pointer is pointing to, we get an error because the P is read only, because we just assigned it, it's a constant pointer. This is the 
same behavior as with references. So you define a references by giving this ampersand symbol instead of star, and you just initialize with the value, so just a without the end percent here. So now r is an alias to the variable a, and it behaves like a pointer in the background. So when you assigned r with the value 33, a is getting assigned with the value of 33. And if you just try to assign r another uh, alias, like for the example variable b, then it's actually just gonna copy the value from b into a. So this is not what you might expect. And if we try to reassign the where the R is aliasing to, well, we get an error because we try to convert int pointer to an int. Because again, R is not a pointer, it's an alias to the A, although it's behaving like a pointer in the background. So this is why you cannot reassign a reference. And here is, for example, how you can reassign pointers. You can just have a non-const pointer, PP, which is by default pointing to null, but then you could just reassign that it's pointing to A, and here it's pointing to B. And in references, you cannot do that. So if you try to just instantiate a reference without giving it a location first, the compiler is gonna give you a warning because you declare the reference but not initialized. So reference have to be initialized to an existing memory location. So this is a bit more powerful than pointers because you can be sure that almost for all instances, the reference always points to a valid location, whereas pointer can in this case point to null, which is not a valid location. But you have to watch out because of the behavior, because they're basically a constant pointer to already initialized variable, you have to have a few cautions when using it. So for example, if you have a function argument that accepts a reference, uh, you, it cannot accept a temporary or a global constant because global constants or some compile time constants can be optimized in the compilation progress. Therefore, in the runtime, those constants don't have a permanent memory locations. Therefore, they don't have an address. So you cannot take a reference to an address that doesn't exist. Therefore, we have two options. So if you take of argument variable of type int uh, by value with or without const, uh, it actually creates a hard copy. So it copies the value of what you're putting in into the function. And if this value is a constant or a global or a literal, so like a number five, then it just converts it directly into the code. But if you try to take in a reference of a, well, it can only accept a reference to a valid object. So it's like a const pointer, but it cannot be to a temporary value or a global constant. So in this case, on the bottom, if you use foo the, on the line two, so the example number two with the constant of five, it's gonna give you this weird value of error. Cannot bind non-const L value reference of type int to an R value of type int. So yeah, this is the weird error that it gives you, which makes more sense when you know what L values and R values are. But for now, if you want to use the function to accept a pointer or a reference to an object, or also a temporary, that you can use a constant reference. So int const reference of A accepts a reference to an existing object or a global constant or a temporary. So it's like a const pointer const in this case, so it accepts all the constants and existing objects as well. And this is all for this video, I wanted to keep it a little bit shorter, so this is all the topics that I wanted to discuss in the first video, so please make sure to play with these examples, replay what I just explained, and also check out the CPP reference on all of these topics, so you can uh, check on references, you can check on variable initialization and assignment, also on the, all the types of enum, enum classes, everything, you can read it on CPP reference. Uh, there are lots of good YouTube videos on these topics as well, which go maybe into a bit more details, but this is just a rough estimation of what C++ can uh, do better than C and what are some additions that can also aid your development so you don't get some so many runtime bugs so you can have more uh, compile time checks. So again, thank you for watching and stay tuned to the next video where we're gonna continue with overloading. Bye.